Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. So when Eisman said he uh, he can't say what he does to unwind on national television, <laughs> what did he mean by that? This is now instantly a not safe for work episode of the Wing Grip Podcast. Yeah, this is a family podcast. I can't give you any of my theories. We also can't say what Eisenman does to unwind. I told you my theory before the episode. <laughs> yeah, that was um, that whole interview. Like Eisenman is usually interview gold, whether you ask him good questions or not, because if they're bad questions, he usually just inserts his he messes around his dry sarcasm. Yeah. He has fun with it. He's like, oh, if I'm going to be here, I'm going to be on my bullshit. And whether people pick it up or not, it's not – he doesn't matter to him. He's just – he's there to make himself laugh. But the um, that interview with TNT, like they did a great job. They got him to open up and they got him to actually talk, crack a few jokes about um, his scholastic player of the year in grade 11. <laughs> that was the best line <laughs> of the interview. Was always what just- an honor. <laughs> and he goes, oh, I didn't graduate grade 12, but uh, grade 11 was a great year. I've always, uh, I've always, obviously, obvious statement of the podcast. I've always liked Steve Eisman as a player and a GM, but uh, you can't really have a parasocial relationship with Steve Eisman. It's the hardest to read or access figure in hockey. He's just a steel wall. But when he Lamorello would like a word, but nobody wants a parasocial <laughs> relationship fair, with Lamorello. <laughs> but when Steve Eisman said when they were asking what he does to unwind, and he goes, "Well." Uh, I golf a lot, but I'm not very good and I don't enjoy it. So I question why I do that. I just have never, <laughs> I've never connected with the Red Wings at all more than that very moment. A part of Evan died that day. No, I, that was totally how I feel too. You're like a, what is it? A, a two, three handicap? Well, I still feel like I'm not very good. <laughs> <laughs> Piss off. What is your handicap right now? Uh, it's a four. Are you serious? Yeah, it was going up. <laughs> Oh, you've already peaked? Probably. I'm old now. This is actually, now that we don't have to move into a house, this is the year of golf. I'm just like, sorry, this is the year of golf? (laughs) This will be the year of golf. I'm going to be grinding. All right. Okay, so Ryan, I'm very concerned now hearing what he golfs because like one of two things has happened and both of which I don't think are real. Either A, he's lying. No. Or B, I'm better at golf than I thought because I kind of kept up with him when we played this summer. (laughs) Did he? Kind of. I don't even remember what I shot, though. Yeah, I was only a few strokes behind him. Like, he definitely beat me. But it wasn't, like, by double digits. You making me feel like an even worse golfer than I already am aside. You realize we now have to hunt for a third podcast host this summer. Because before wasn't the year of golf, this is. Abby's no, been I trying got... to get on. She no, has. no. What's going to happen this summer is now I have to do research. You're on your own. I'm going with him. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe I'll just move down to Detroit. <laughs> Uh, Ken, if you're listening, I'm going to need some help. <laughs> Bring Mick. I'll supply the ginger ales. All right, folks. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, here, suffering with a terrible golf handicap that I won't disclose to you today. I'm Ryan Hanna. Completely oblivious to what my own handicap actually is, Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a couple of a moment this week. What will yours be, Ryan? <sighs> <laughs> I don't think I can say it on. Uh, <laughs> it will happen and you'll regret it. I It will and I will. Uh, on this episode of the Wind Wheel podcast, it actually features a lengthy but um, exciting conversation that we had with our good friends Prashanth Iyer and Max Boltman. Um, our periodic, I guess, or, or recurring theme or segment, we should call it, uh, the Red Wings Roundtable. We gave you part one of our midseason review uh, last episode, and this is part two, which is the roundtable with Prashanth and Max. So we talked about as many different topics as we could, um, and we still didn't cover it all, so we're going to be due for another one. But that is uh, an exciting segment we're here to, or we're excited for you to listen to, I should say. Uh, we are also going to be talking about, uh, first, the Red Wings game that happened last night, all 55 goals that took place during the game. Uh, And then if depending on time, we'll have a couple uh, takeaways from the NHL. Evander Kane has kind of signed. Aaron Dell got suspended. A a lot has happened in the world of hockey, but we want to make sure we can give it um, the time it needs. Before all that, 
I want to remind you again, wings money on the board. It's an ongoing campaign that we started alongside Prashanth Iyer in benefit of the Jamie Daniels foundation. Go to wingedwheelpodcast.com slash blog and click the wings money on the board post to find out more. You watch the red wings, you make pledges on uh, players, the team, special teams, coaches, the woos you hear in the stands, whatever you want to make it positive or negative, and then uh, you make donations based on how many times those things happen. Uh, there's great giveaways, there's prizes, um, and of course, recognition from Ken Daniels, Lisa Daniels Goldman, the founders of the Jamie Daniels, Fund- Jamie Daniels Foundation, uh, and they share their appreciation um, every time we get a chance to talk about it. So wings, money on the board. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the Jamie Daniels Foundation, visit jamiedanielsfoundation.org. What's up? What? Minor, minor breaking news as we're actually recording. Relevant to the Red Wings. Go for it. Justin Applicator has been released from his PTO with the Grand Rapids Griffins oh. and is joining Team USA as an alternate for the Olympics. Oh, it is an Olympics thing. It was an Olympics thing. Is that a boy, Abby? I have an egg on my face. I was certain it wasn't. I Well, actually, one of you said to me, maybe he's just like trying out as an alternate. Like, and the US Team USA hasn't publicized it because of the like, COVID stuff. And that's what it ended up being. Yeah. Good for you, Abby. And actually, you know what? Good on the Grand Rapids Griffins for giving him that Hell yeah. opportunity. Hell yeah. Oh, that's great. Love it. You let you love a feel good story to start an episode. Back. Now about tonight, last night's game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just want to start by saying Hey, the Red Wings scored five goals. Right? Like oh. amazing. That's uh near a season high for them. Was that a good game altogether? From an entertainment style value or a quality of hockey value? <laughs> Because <laughs> the answer is different. <laughs> the lack of defense reminded me of a certain football game. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, because those were good offenses that were exploiting the opponent's defense. This was not good offenses exploiting somehow worse defenses. The only comment I'll make about that Bills game is I'm angry at the NFL for ending it in such a way that made me feel bad for Brad. That was the second football game I've watched this year. You need to if, – if that's how every football game you watch goes, you need to watch more for the good of the rest of us. I'm not a superstition stu- – superstitious person, but Evan, if you ever watch another Bills game, <laughs> I'll punch you. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, that Red Wings game, it ended up being – what was the final score? Seven? Eight, eight five. five. Thirteen goals. The first period was about one of the worst periods the Red Wings have played all year. Can I even can we even say that though? They were dominating the first six, seven minutes. But then, four then, goals. It just, then the cliff just was steep. Very steep. Four goals. Dylan Strom, I think, tripled his career points total in ten minutes or something stupid like that. Um just wasn't good. The Red Wings went to the dressing room down four nothing. And then period two was theirs. Robbie Fabry put one on the board. Tyler Bertuzzi put one on the board. Pew Suter put one on the board. Goal, actually, that was Tyler Bertuzzi's 20th goal of the season. Wow. Yeah. And uh, Robbie Fabry's second goal, where he undressed the goalie this week. And Pew Suter, that, like, excellently placed shot. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll talk about it later in the roundtable, but one of the more underappreciated but consistently solid Red Wings players nearly all year. Mm-hmm. 4-3, which is incredible because at 4 nothing, someone said, I think it was Rick Tockett in the uh, in the intermission said, you know, 3 nothing is doable. To go into the intermission down 3 nothing, you can manage that. Like, it doesn't feel so bad, but 4 nothing is kind of a gut punch. They essentially needed a three-goal period at least, and that's what they came up with. And then in the, in the third is when, I don't know, it somehow became more chaotic in the third period. You know, Dylan Stroh made it 5-3. Alex Dabrinkit made it 6-3. And you were like, uh, another three goal lead. This is out of reach. Mo Sider rips one from the point on the power play, assisted by Lucas Raymond and Tyler Bertuzzi. Six four. Dylan Larkin with a the snipe to end all snipes. Gorgeous shot. It was. It went in so fast. They had to check to make sure it went in. One thing I want to point out, um, just because um, who was it? Max, I believe, pointed it out in the round table. We I need to give Max credit. We recorded. The round table part of that before that game. Yeah. And Max went out of his way to make a point about Dylan Larkin's improved shot. And then Dylan roars him by proving it. Putting it on his foot. Yeah. (laughs) 
six five and the momentum there was about five minutes left in the third and the momentum at that point was detroit's i was firmly in belief that they were going to tie that game and then what happened and then nick letty committed an unforgivable crime as far as defensemen go as my dad was a very uh He was a hockey dad, but not like a belligerent, insane hockey dad. Like he wanted me to be the best player I could, but was never like insane about it. Would be like firm when he told me about the things I did wrong, but always constructive. The only times I would ever get the cold shoulder on the ride home from my dad, like just the silent treatment, like there's nothing to say because how could you make that mistake? Is when you make a pass across, either across your crease or across your zone with an opposing player bearing in. Like essentially like throwing into triple coverage if you're a quarterback in the NFL and it's not Calvin Johnson (laughs) trying to receive the ball. Nick Letty gave the puck away in one of the most blatantly bad giveaways we've seen from the Red Wings this season, which is saying quite a bit. It was it was the worst giveaway by a Red Wings defenseman since Nick Letty against the Leafs. (laughs) (laughs) And from there, the comeback was deflated. Yeah, can't do that. Can't do that. And that was it. That was 7-5. Game finished 8-5. It was fun, but uh, oh boy, were the worst parts of the Red Wings on display. That was a showcase as to how bad the defense on both those teams truly is. Um, Obviously, the Red Wings in particular. Uh, No goaltender bailed out anybody that game. Calvin uh, Calvin Pickard had one really nice save on a Dabrinka breakaway. That was... About the only notable goaltending thing that happened that game. Um, and the forwards from both teams picked on it. It was, it was nice to see the Red Wings do that for once because I feel like they've let opportunity slip when that happens before. Uh, where you look at their opposition and go, they're not playing great, but it the score doesn't get run up. But yeah, it, it's hard to say. Any defenseman on the Red Wings played well. Um, Mo Sider was good, but it was below his usual. Yeah. Uh, DeKaiser and Letty in particular were exceptionally bad that game, even by DeKaiser's already low standards. And, you know, Letty has higher standards, but he hasn't really lived up to him to this year, but he's not been bad. Um. I mean, yeah, Stahl and Osterley just and Hronik were there, not really helping all that much. I think Hronik actually tipped through two through Nadelkovich. One of them ended up in the net, and the other one almost ended up in the net. But he also tipped Bertuzzi's shot, which Bertuzzi picked out the <laughs> rebound on. So. Yeah. I mean, if he's putting him in both nets, then that's fine. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to say this about that game. That game was a perfect display of what is fundamentally wrong with the Red Wings and why people's expectations shouldn't be too high about the season. And I don't think too many people are like on cloud nine about this year anymore, but the Red Wings as they're configured right now in defense, just don't have the roster to defend. That's it. Like they just don't have the guys like De Kaiser didn't even play a lot of minutes. Uh, there's no one really who's going to go out there and shut the team, the other team down. The offense was on display. The offense, you know, picked it up when they needed to. In the first period, there wasn't enough to say for conversion, of course. No goals against four. But they put up five. And they picked it up. And they almost surmounted two massive leads or uh, deficits. But the defense just let them down. And that it was like a microcosm of the entire season. I have no problem accepting that those games are going to happen. It's just a sign of what the Red Wings need to work on moving forward in terms of roster construction. Yeah, and the offense came from all the usual suspects. Since they put Bertuzzi on the second line with the Guelph Guelph connection, as we've talked about, they've been great. They scored three goals. Um, And where did the other two goals come from? Well, one from Dylan Larkin and the other one from Mo Sider set up by Lucas Raymond on the power play. So it was the top six, once again, carrying the load. And the only thing... To note from the bottom six was uh, Philip Zadina and Joe Valeno had really nice bounce back games. Yeah. Um, Nothing to show for it. This is a recording. But (laughs) they they were very noticeable that game rather than just, yeah, I think they play right. They were both very noticeable that game. Um, Just nothing dropped for them. Again, 
Valeno so looked for the Michigan from behind the net at one point. Yeah, he, he kind of went for it, realized it wasn't really there, and then the one defenseman shifted. He kind of went for it again. He's like, nah, because he had, uh, I think it was Gagne wide open in the slot. He's like, oh, I'll just give it to him. Yeah. Um, which I love. But, yeah, it was, I think, a microcosm of the season is a good way to put it, with the only difference being the goaltending didn't bail them out this time, which it has so often this season. Yeah. Uh, that tear that Ned was on up until recently, I'm sure we'll see flashes of that again, but you can't bank on that all year. If it comes up, that's great. And Ned's young, and he's very, obviously, extremely skilled in net, but there's going to be times where he's just not. He's either going to have a bad game or an average game, and if your defense is bad defense plus average goalie equals bad time, and bad defense plus a goalie on an off night means he's getting yanked to the first. Yeah, their penalty kill really got picked on last night, too. Yeah. Which... um Coupling last night's game with the uh, article Dom dropped today was just uh, what? What's the word? Concerning. The Red Wings have one of the toughest strengths of schedule for the rest of the season. Not one of D. The, the it's toughest because they're the Red Wings. No, no, no. Like the strength of the other team. Yeah, no. I'm saying is because they're the Red Wings. Yeah, they don't get to play. They don't get to play the Red Wings in the second half. Just like Florida doesn't have to play Florida. But yeah, yeah they they went from having literally by strength of schedule. The easiest, the number one easiest first half of the schedule to the hardest, number one hardest strength of schedule in the second half. So buckle up, folks. This could get ugly. Nick Led- and here comes Pittsburgh and Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, that's going to be most weeks now from here on out. Yeah, because it's Toronto without Bertuzzi because that's in Canada. Oh no! Yeah, so that's and that's a back to back. So it's Friday away in Pittsburgh. No. Oh no no! no. Toronto's at home. Yeah yeah. Sorry. sorry oh sorry, thank sorry. God. Yeah, it's Pittsburgh is away and then Toronto's at home. You're right. You're right. That's my bad. It is not until. Oh, it's not for some time until they're in Canada. That's a very small February schedule. Um. Well, February is a very small month. <laughs> Yeah, that, enough. that was supposed to be their break, and that's where they reallocated a lot of their, their mm. shifted games. Anyhow, they got uh, Pittsburgh Friday night, Toronto Saturday night, both at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, it's away and then home. So, yeah, the Red Wings got a big test coming up. And if you're concerned about it, just think it as think of each game as possibly one step closer to Shane Wright. That's it. Honestly, the moment Raymond passed it to Cider for that goal... I was like, yeah, I got what I needed out of this game. <laughs> yep. Wait, turn, the, turn this off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Win or lose, that's fine. Um, I am going to reiterate, move tr- move Nick Letty at the trade deadline. I think at this point, he's not he's not like a he's not a terrible player. He's not bad. Like the Red Wings have have seen and currently have much worse. But I think, based on the re- reputation Nick Letty has, a deadline team. A contending team might have more value for him and might give up more than the Red Wings could get from get from him in terms of play value. Uh, I also, before we jump into the round table here, want to call out Elliot Friedman in Thirty Two Thoughts had a point about the Red Wings, which doesn't happen terribly often because the Red Wings haven't been relevant for a while. He said, um, and he was very clear that this was just his inkling because Steve Eisman doesn't uh, let anything out. He wonders what's going to happen with Philip Zadina in a trade context. Fresh situation. I want to reiterate, Steve Eisenman genuinely is a vault. The only times that we know of where something has been leaked that's been accurate regarding the Red Wings has been because it's been unavoidable, i.e. they were talking to other teams and someone from the other team leaked it, that kind of thing. However, I am a big where there's smoke, there's fire person, and I don't think this is a four story building on fire i think this is like a little small campfire i'm not of the mind that they should move zadina right now i think he's having an atrocious year in terms of results the mental game is just compounding and making those issues worse the guy needs a reset i'm not necessarily saying he needs a a brand new scene but he needs some kind of reset um but his value is as low as it's ever been and he is he is still extremely young. So for me, it doesn't really make sense. However, I could see a situation where Zadina, not necessarily this year, maybe later on, goes on a tear, starts producing a little bit more, his value goes up, and then they move him. If they do. Right. 
reset, whatever you want to call them, reclamation project trades, they happen in the NHL often enough. Usually there's a few every year. Um, Steve weisman has been involved in a few of them, but he's almost always on the other side of that trade. He doesn't seem like the type of guy to get impatient and trade away what is a very good asset when that asset's value is at its lowest. Like, what do you think is more likely? Like, there's two ways to frame this in terms of odds. What is more likely? You get full value in trade for a guy who hasn't scored a goal in 18 games or a highly talented six overall pick who's playing pretty well with bad shooting luck regresses to the mean in a positive way. What's more likely to happen there? The latter, but I do want to put in the like recurring qualify here that I think this is more than shooting luck. No, it is. There's a confidence factor that definitely goes in. It's not even shooting luck. It's uh, We talk about it on the roundtable. Some of it's shooting mechanics um, and mindset of shot. But, I mean, nobody really has any criticisms about Zadina anywhere else on the ice. So it, it really does come down to, hey, if he figures out this one thing and he fixes it, which has happened before with players because the easiest thing to fix and teach in hockey is a shot. Um, then you have a, still have a pretty good player. Is Philip Zadine ever going to be a sixth overall pick value? Eh, probably not. I think we can all agree on that. Mm-hmm. Um, is Philip Zadina even as a, let's say, career 9% shooter, if that's what it regresses to, is that a very valuable middle six player in the NHL? Yes, very valuable. You take him as he is now with everything he's doing in the other 200 feet of the ice and you have the puck drop every four or five games for him. That's a valuable NHL player. Well, no matter what, I'm sure the conversation will be civil and not beat to death from now until kingdom come. I actually look forward to the trade deadline being over because if I had to put my money on it, I would say he doesn't get moved anytime soon if at all. And now I've just jinxed it into happening and I'll have egg on my face yet again. Um, we're going to jump into the round table soon, but before I do that, I first want to tell everyone that this episode of the Wayne wheel podcast is proudly brought to you by the FanDuel sports book. There's so many reasons why FanDuel is America's number one sports book. Uh, they're easy to use from registration to deposits and getting, uh, whatever bet you want and withdrawals are quick and easy. FanDuel pays your winnings back in as little as 24 hours. There are often odds boosts and specials, uh, every day with some big super boosts each weekend. Now listen to this. FanDuel is letting you place your first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Just place a bet on any game and FanDuel will refund you up to $1,000 back in site credit if you don't win your first bet. No strings attached. You win, you keep the cash. You lose, you get that grand in site credit back. What we want you to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app to get started with that risk-free bet. And be sure to sign up with promo code WWP so they know the Winged Wheel podcast sent you. That's FanDuel Sportsbook promo code WWP. You must be 21 and older and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Iowa, Tennessee, Virginia, or Michigan. First online real money wager only. Site credit is non-withdrawable and expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See sportsbook.fanduel.com for details. If you have a gambling problem, problem call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Virginia, Tennessee Red Line 1-800-889-9789, 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia, or call 1-800-270-7117 in Michigan. Okay. We're going to jump into our Red Wings Roundtable mid-season recap edition with Prashanth Iyer and Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit. Uh, Always a good conversation when we can get the crew together. We hope you enjoy. So we were overdue for another roundtable, a Red Wings Roundtable, and and, um, credit to you, Prashanth. You're actually the first one who raised it, who said it's probably time that we get together again, especially a mid-season. Although I do think... Maybe it was a mistake to litigate the entire rookie of the year discussion and the entire coaching discussion and uh, maybe what next year's draft pick is going to be all before hitting record. Maybe we got a little ahead of ourselves there. Uh, yeah. Welcome, folks. Brad and I are joined again by uh, friends of the podcast, Max Boltman and Prashanth Iyer, uh, Max of The Athletic Detroit and Prashanth of Being a Father. How's everyone doing? Can't complain here, man. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for having us on. Prashanth, tell us about the little guy. 
He is, uh, he's almost four months, um, and he likes to yell at his toys. So, you know, we're, we're at a great stage in life. Uh, he just sits there and he just starts babbling at them. And I have no idea what he's saying, but you know, it sounds like all of his toys are occupied just, just to so we're clear. So we are starting him young. I mean, he just sits there and he babbles at them. So. All right. Well, he's well suited for a podcast then. He can take Brad's spot. (laughs) Okay. So the Red Wings have passed the halfway mark of the season and, uh, it's been an interesting one and maybe I shouldn't say maybe definitely a year that we weren't expecting. So I'm going to pose this question to you and we'll start with Max. What is the most notable storyline of the year? And you can go player team wide, whatever it is, not including the rookies, Moritz Sider and Lucas Raymond. Oh, you just saved me. Cause I was like, <laughs> how do I, how do I not pick the rookies here? Or which one do I pick? Uh, are we counting Nedeljkovic as a rookie? No, no, you can count Ned. All right, so that's an interesting. I think that's a pretty big one, but I kind of think Tyler Bertuzzi has to be the story here, and not for the reasons I think people would have thought. Uh, I don't know what was it a week before training camp there. Um, <laughs> yeah, Tyler Bertuzzi might be their best player so far, and you know I still think Dylan Larkin kind of has that that role as the center, and and I think in a lot of ways their engine. But uh, every line Tyler Bertuzzi is touching is turning to gold. Uh, he, he's a, above a point per game player and he's doing it in every way imaginable. He's scoring, he's playmaking in the last week. His playmaking has been phenomenal. He's grinding. He's playing the Tyler Bertuzzi game. Everyone has come to know and love. I think he's the story of the season so far for me. This guy is, is tremendous. He's taken it up even another level. What, what fascinates me about his whole career, and we don't have to do this right off the top is that it feels like everyone at every stage has said, yeah, but you got to prove it a little more, right? Like he comes up and it's like, all right, but how good are you really? And he, he shoots and it's like, yeah, okay. Shooting percentage. We'll, we'll wait for that to come back down to earth. Uh, guys, the shooting percentage just goes up. It doesn't go down for him. It just keeps going up. He's a point per game player. And if he's not their best player, he's two or three. And, and you know what? Like this guy, uh, is playing phenomenally. It's funny because we just had one of many Bertuzzi discussions last episode and the chorus around Bertuzzi has been, what's his future like? There's the obvious storyline, like you mentioned, from a week before the season, but also consider his his career trajectory. He's not a rookie anymore. He's not incredibly young, but he's still playing probably at the near the peak of his output. He's coming off pretty major back surgery and he's having the best year of his life. Also, a couple pretty uh, tenuous negotiations with the Red Wings for his contracts. He's he's locked in for one more year after this one finishes. I'm not you, you know we're not necessarily advocating for yeah, definitely trade Bertuzzi or 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 keep him at all costs, but what's the future like and and what kind of position is Steve Eisman in with trying to deal him or keep him? Well, that's the crazy thing. Prashant is going to have a, a, a big take here, and we we talk about it, he and I, in our side text. I'm just going to cut him off here and pre- <laughs> preempt him here with, with him because I know his is coming. Um, and, and it's really important conversation that he's going to lead us to. But, you know, t- to, to your point, Ryan, like it's a huge factor. And you talk about the previous contracts. That's kind of what I mean when I say he's had to keep proving it. Like they keep going short term deals. Back back in the old days, back when Prashant and I had a podcast, if you can remember all the way back then, I remember a conversation where we were talking about, you know, what do you do with Tyler Bertuzzi's contract? Do you go long? Do you go short? And it was like a legitimate question that people had of like, is this going to be an Abdulkader 2.0 situation? Uh, well, guys, no. <laughs> it turns out that it's not. Uh, and and I think you probably wish you had locked Tyler Bertuzzi up for six years back at that point at, at whatever number you could have gotten him at. It probably would have been like five, five and a half million and he would have been one of the value contracts of the NHL, right? I, I pull that number out of complete nowhere. That's not – I just – to be clear before that uh, turns into something I didn't intend for it to be. But I just – I remember that conversation and do you go short? Do you go – I think we even said, Prashant, you, you do go midterm and, and you just keep letting him prove it. We, we endorsed what has proven to be uh, the one thing you, do, you don't do to Tyler Bertuzzi and that's dare him to prove it because – that's what happens. But now, Prashant, I will let you get into uh, the future because I know you got you got some really uh, well thought out, nuanced uh, thoughts here. I mean, yeah, like piggybacking off of what Max said, you're you're absolutely right. People counted him out at every level, and he just continues to sort of prove people wrong. But you know, Ryan, to your point, I think the challenge here now is if you sort of look at how the Red Wings roster stacks up, and you 
look at who the minute eaters are for them and, and what their ages are. And you start thinking about, okay, what's going to be my contending window? You know, the team showed flashes so far this season, but they're, they're clearly not there. Yes. They're right behind Boston for the wild card, but Boston's got three games in hand and they're eight points up. So that that's a pipe dream. Um, but they're, they're improving and they're, they're getting in that right direction. It's just how quickly can you get to the next level with Tyler Bertuzzi being 26 with you only having him, you know, under contract for one more year. And if he keeps playing this way, he's going to be due for a monster raise. You know, do, how much does how much time do you really have with Bertuzzi, Larkin, as sort of your centerpieces of of your championship team, or is it sort of time to to maybe offload a Bertuzzi in that scenario and sort of focus on building a contending window around? Raymond, Sider, Edmondson, Nadelkovich, sort of that that younger group that's a couple years behind those guys. And I think that's the million dollar question right now is what do you do with those guys and 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 what do you perceive your contending window to be? Brad, you are Steve Eisenman. And I always said that. <laughs> Just a touch shorter. Uh you're Steve Eisenman and you get a package similar to let's say what Mantha uh, fetch for the Red Wings, and you get offered that at this trade deadline. What do you do? Um, I would probably take it. Um, for a couple, the two main reasons already being outlined. One, the contract situation scares the hell out of me, especially considering if you don't extend him next year, you lose him for nothing. And whether or not you plan on being a contender in two years or five years, that has to factor in more than anything. You can't lose him for nothing above all else. Um, and two, the back injury scares the hell out of me. He shows no slowing down and it's not affecting him this year. But as we saw with many other players in the past, young and old, you know, Zetterberg towards the end of his career, Cody Hodgson at the beginning of his career, it can derail a guy quickly. So if you can get a slightly younger player of the skill set of a Jacob Rana, a second round pick and a first round pick, I mean, how do you not do it? Even if, Obviously, Verona has worked out to be pretty close in value to Mantha, but let's say it's a little more towards what you expected and you get 75% of Tyler Bertuzzi as that player return. The odds are good that first round pick is going to make up that extra 25%. And like Prashanth mentioned, which is obviously relevant, those assets are a lot younger, are going to be in their prime when it matters and will be controlled for a lot longer. So just from the cold heart dollars and cents of it, yeah, you're maxing out value that way. So let's pull back and, and talk about the team a little bit more broadly here. Uh, this is a Red Wings team that had a really hot, hot start. At one point, was pretty firmly in a wild card uh, playoff position, even by points percentage. And from pretty much December onwards, has looked performance wise, or at least the numbers on the the standings, a little bit more like the Red Wings we've seen from the last couple seasons. Uh, how is this? kind of matched up against your expectations for the season and uh, what are your thoughts for the Red Wings with a very difficult schedule moving forward? I think among the hardest in the NHL. Yeah. I mean, I would say it's kind of eased into the preseason expectations, right? Like it's certainly the start. I, I, I did, I thought they were a bottom five team coming into the year and, and for the first month of the season, month and a half of the season, they were a fringe playoff team and that, you know, that, that was in uh, the standings, but there were also some advanced metrics that said that the standings weren't a fluke at, at that time. And it was early. And so for that reason, you know, I didn't step on the gas pedal and say, you know, this is what they are. And, and I think the reason why I didn't do that has shown, which is that, you know, it, it can, the, the water kind of finds its level a little bit. And, and I think the water dipped below its level at, at times there in November and really brought them back down to earth. Um, it, but I think ultimately now what you see here at the mid season point is basically the, the real picture. And um, that is basically a team that's at the edge of the bottom 10. They could finish a little better than that. Or they could finish a little worse than that, but they're not, you know, they're not going to make the playoffs in the East. The, the road, the math on the road is just insane. You basically have to be Tampa the rest of the way. Um, and you need Boston or Washington or Pittsburgh to, um, drop off in a big way. It's like even just being Tampa for the second half would not, I don't think on its own be enough to get the trade in. So uh, that alone tells you that they're, they're not doing it this year. But I, I actually don't think that precludes us from saying this year has been a, a meaningful step forward because um, they are better than I thought they would be. And even though lately they've been more like what I expected, there's things like the arrival of Alex Nadelkovich, 
Moritz Seider not just being a, a really, really good defense prospect, but a number one NHL defenseman immediately. Like we're at the midway point of his first season, and I feel good saying that that Moritz Seider is a number one NHL defenseman already. Those are two things between that and, and a top half of the league starting goaltender that I, I don't think you can even try to put a, a, a value on on that. It's it's they're invaluable to, to the organization. Yeah, I mean you're you're hitting the nail on the head. I think. Sure, they've certainly regressed maybe to where a lot of us thought they would be at the beginning of the season, but I think that, that they've absolutely taken a meaningful step forward. I think at least the way I tend to evaluate teams is think of what their ceiling is, their averages, and what their floor is. So when they're playing their best, that's their ceiling. When they're playing their worst, that's their floor. And when they're playing the average is sort of what you're going to see on most nights. And and when you look at sort of the best teams, their average is going to be better than, than the majority of the teams there. And when they're playing at their ceiling, they're just about impossible to beat. And when they're on their floor, they're still going to beat some teams. Uh, they just may not do it with regularity. And then you go to the other end where you look at sort of where Detroit's been the last few years as a bottom five team. Their best may allow them to hang around with some of the better teams, but they're probably not going to pull out many of those. Their average is going to basically keep them competitive in most games, but you're not going to win those. And then their floor, they look really stinking bad. They lose 6 nothing to Toronto. Um, and what I think has happened this year is the ceiling looks better, the average looks better, and the floor is not as nasty as it was before. And so I think all of those sort of point to the signs that this team is maybe moving the needle in the right direction, although they're still going to probably end up a you know bottom 10, bottom 12 team on, at the end of the year. Yeah, the ceiling right now is you can go on the road and come back from behind two goals and beat Washington, right? Like, right. like no world is that happening in the last two years. But the next step is number one, can you do stuff like that consistently? Or number two, can you blow out one of these teams and not have to come back on them? Or, or not even necessarily blow them out, but, but, you know, lead that game four to one at some point, um, and, and not have to basically dig your way out. Like the fact they can do it at all is, you know, if you'd have told it somebody that in 2019, 20, that within two years, they'd be coming back on the road against Washington and, and winning. Uh, I think anybody would have uh, yeah, I mean, been stunned, you know, you're right. Like what you're aspiring for is what Tampa did to Detroit at the beginning of the season, right? They come back from two, three goal deficits because they can without yeah. all of their talent, but on most nights, Tampa is not going to be in that position. And, and that's what Detroit wants to be in is where they're not in the position where they need to do that. But if they need to do that, they can do that. Or they close out Tampa when they have right. a three goal lead. Yeah. They had a three goal lead in that game, right? Six yeah, three or something. Two like that. three goal leads. They were yeah. four one and six three, and, and Detroit couldn't hang on to them either. And that's what you're looking for at the next level is put away those good teams when you've got the, you know, when you when you when you've got that three goal lead there. And so I think the progress is there. We wouldn't have seen a three goal lead against Tampa in the last two years. So, you know, that's a that's a big step forward. So compiling all that, what this is essentially. So we're adding up to is Detroit's drafting sixth overall again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think they'd be thrilled to draft six overall at this point though, right? Like I yeah. think they're going to draft like 10th or 11th overall unless they win a lottery. Yeah. They're, they're looking at around that range and I am going to ask for your thoughts on who might be snagged there in a, in a little bit here. Uh, Max, you mentioned Mo Sider and the kind of season he's having. And the one thing we actually did talk about before hitting record was laughing about the progression of how the Red Wings ended up drafting Cider and how it blew all of us away and the furious typing you had to do that night, Max. Furious as in pace, not angry, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, Quick, rapid. Yes. The always, I always felt that Max was the fastest typing sports writer I know, just personally. <laughs> <laughs> the, the season most Cider is having, let's dial in on him. How big of an impact is this to the team and how surprising is it every time he shatters through this, you know, our, whatever ceiling that we put on him. We'll start off with Brad. I mean, it's impossible to be surprised by him at this point. We've all learned our lesson on that, but I can't lie and say I'm not surprised by him this season because like Max alluded to earlier, he's a number one defenseman on an NHL team. He's on number one defenseman on not a bottom five NHL team. And there's no debate about it. And he's probably not, the worst number one defenseman in the NHL. At, he's definitely not. Yeah. Yeah. At 20 years old. And it's not that he's doing it one dimensionally where he's a phenomenal shutdown defenseman, but a 
black hole offensively, or he's this offensive dynamo that gets caved in his own zone. There is no area on the ice. He struggles. You need him to gap up off the rush. He's got it. You need him to run a good zone coverage when, you know, the other team's running a cycle. He's got it. You need that guy to make the perfect transition pass at the right time. He's got it. You need someone to walk the blue line in the offensive zone. No problem. You need someone to activate off the blue line to help keep the cycle alive and get the puck to the slot. He can do it. I'm, I mean, the only criticism I have of him this year is he doesn't look to shoot enough. Oh, no, that that's going to be so hard to fix. Um, yeah, it's truly unbelievable what he's doing at 20 years old and what he did at 19 years old winning the shl defenseman of the year and what he did at 18 years old and before that got shut down was on pace to set a whole bunch of u19 ahl defenseman records so i mean we've made this joke a million times every six months there's a referendum on mo cider and the baseline of what he did gets shot up another couple miles totally i mean that that's the craziest thing about him is that he's made it uh, impossible to be surprised by anything he does. The, you know, these, these plays that he started pulling out at the start of this year. I, I don't know if he did this in the SHL or not. I, I, I kind of have a vague memory of something like it, but where he pulls the puck kind of between his legs and, you know, swivels out his ass to, to shield the puck and then it's an entry or it's a great pass or whatever. Like these are plays that should, should ooh and ah, should draw oohs and ahs. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, he's, he's going to do that. That makes sense. And, and, and this is what amazing players do to, to the experience of watching them is it takes, the, what the bar for like, oh, wow. It, and it ups it like several notches. And it's why that you don't see Kale McCarr on the highlight every night. And you only see it when it's his like most amazing thing. Cause so much of what Kale McCarr does is like, yeah, sure. Of course that, you know, that, that's not a McCarr highlight. That's a highlight for a normal defenseman for McCarr. That's, that's Tuesday. And, it, but there's so many things like that for Cider. Like, even if you look at the way I really like Brad's point about, you know, wh- whatever you want to ask him to do, he can do it really well. And, one of the things he does when he's defending the rush is he he takes this route to defend the the entry where he goes forward and he he completely takes away anything that the forward wants to do. You're not cutting back on him, so he's either going to hit you or you're going to dump the puck deep. And 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 if you do, he's already pivoted and he's skating forward and he's faster than you. So good luck. Like it's just like he doesn't do that every single time, but whenever he does it, it's like how on earth would you even hope to succeed on that play as a forward and. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I can't say enough good things about him as a player. And t- as much as I say, like, you can't be surprised by him anymore. And that's true. Um, just what a, what a treat it is to watch him. He, he's a special player. Yeah. I think you're, you know, the, the, the one devil's advocate I'll introduce here is, you know, as good as he's looked for the Red Wings so far, it is a half season. And we've seen a lot of young defensemen over the years, put up a good half season, put up a good season, and then regress the following season. I mean, a classic example right now is in Vancouver looking at Quinn Hughes. Everyone was over the moon with him. Now, now I'm not saying Sider's anywhere near a similar player to Quinn Hughes. They obviously play very different hockey games. But, you know, the point still stands that we've seen this before from a lot of different defensemen. And so I think it's important to make sure that this continues to progress. But, I mean, as of right now, you know, the trajectory looks very good. What you have to sort of avoid is the regression that you saw with the Quinn Hughes and Ivan Provorov and sort of those guys that had really nice rookie seasons or really good first couple of uh, you know years and then sort of started to take steps back. So I don't think that's going to be the case with Mo Sider. I'm really optimistic with what you've seen so far. He looks like he's sort of trending on the path of a guy like you know a Jacob Chikrin or a Mikhail Sergachev, like good, really solid, steady defenseman that can sort of do it all for you. Um, but I think it's important to make sure we continue to see that over the back half of the year. Totally. It's a great point because it, it nobody's career is made in 40 games and, and plenty of careers look like they're, they might look like they are. And then, you know, you got to keep doing it, but it's, it's, it's been as good a start as you could have hoped for. No yeah. doubt. I mean, you just don't want Tyler Myers, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're probably all right there. Um, I think so I, too. Yeah. The one counterpoint I would have, even though I fully in agreement with you that it's 42 games, like taking another context, the difference between him and a Quinn Hughes is Quinn Hughes was elite and is elite because of one dimension of his game by and large, as we mentioned, cider does not have that issue. So I do expect the counting stats to regress. Like I, I don't think the points he's putting up right now are sustainable. One, because he's a 20-year-old defenseman and 
Two, the other teams are going to start keying on him. They know he's the biggest threat off the blue line, so they're going to game plan for that. But even when he is shut down offensively, he's still going to have positive impacts all over the ice. Moving forward to the 2020 draft here, and I, I'm not going to re- bring up the same discussion that I put in the group chat earlier, which is what the hell's going on with Alexi Lafreniere. Um, that's the draft where the Red Wings almost, I mean, looking at it retrospectively, won it in their own right uh, by taking Lucas Raymond fourth overall. And he's uh, part of either the other half or part of the trifecta, depending on how you look at it, of the uh, Red Wings rookie dominance this year. Was he an even bigger surprise in your minds to come in and do what he's done this season than Mo Sider? And how has that changed not only the trajectory of the Red Wings rebuild, but also uh, the players around him like Dylan Larkin and Tyler Bertuzzi especially? I'd say yes, in the sense of like this year, I expected Mort Sider to come in and be a top pair defenseman. Like I expected him to do that in the preseason. I, I even, you know, I didn't expect him to be as good as he's been. Um, but again, at the rate he was going, I wouldn't have taken it off the table either. With Raymond, up until a week at, in the training camp, I'd have probably still told you, I think this guy is probably going to start the year in Grand Rapids, even though he was really good in, in training camp and all that, right? Like, and the prospect tournament, like I thought he was really good there, but I still would have probably said he starts in Grand Rapids. And then first game, okay, wow. First preseason game, okay, wow. Second preseason game, oh, uh, third preseason game. Well, this guy's on the team and he's on the top six. Like it was, I think it was that third game. It was against Chicago. And for like the next month straight, you know, he, he didn't end the preseason on a heater. I think, you know, I think he actually quieted down a little bit at that point, but it was a breakneck pace of, of schedule there, uh, in the preseason. And, and he starts the regular season great too. And yeah, I mean, he, he has been an, an immediate top six borderline top line player, um, for the for the better part of of the season and so yeah i I think i've been more surprised by how quickly it's happened for him um yeah i I think that's fair to say yeah i mean i have to absolutely agree with that like i mean if you just look back to the september october discussion it was not you know cemented that lucas raymond was going to be on this team i mean there was no guarantee there i think a lot of a lot of us weren't even sure what to expect a lot of us weren't even sure if he was going to make the team. And then if he did, would he get more than nine games? Like, would they even burn the contract? And then, you know, lo and behold, he, he, he comes out flying and, and has really elevated the play of that top line. And, and Dylan Larkin in particular is just having a ridiculous season. Um, I think, which is partly due to playing with a guy as smart as Lucas Raymond and then obviously Tyler Bertuzzi um, up until recently. So, you know, I think he's a bigger surprise because even though Sider maybe at the time was the bigger surprise draft pick, uh, we saw two years of Cider doing really good stuff in Grand Rapids and then over in Sweden that sort of set the stage for him to step in um, and, and maybe be able to have a bigger impact. Yeah, a thousand percent Raymond's the bigger surprise, but the biggest surprise is the trajectory. Um, again, it's no secret here. I, I was the Lucas Raymond truth or his whole draft yeah. year. I was banging the table for him, but I didn't expect this as quickly, especially his draft plus one year. He was having a good year in Forlunda, but I wouldn't say it was exceptional. I wouldn't say it was a season that it's like, yeah, he has to come over. He has to play top six and he has to contribute. Um, it was like, yeah, maybe he's got a shot to make the team a year in Grand Rapids probably be best for him. I think going into training camp, if there was a money line on Raymond to make the team. I would have bet not making it would have been the favorite. Um, And, you know, he did have a really good showing at the world juniors. So it showed you that glimpse the previous season of, okay, yeah, yeah. He's, he's still that guy. Um, But yeah, the breakneck pace he's been playing at is crazy. And I, I know on our podcast, we've talked about a bunch. Some guys just, play better exponentially with better players because they are so smart and they just, when the talent around them is increased, theirs is increased, you know, twofold or threefold. And I think Raymond's one of those guys because he knows what to do on the ice. And when Dylan Larkin's flying around at a billion miles an hour at playing at the top of his game and Bertuzzi's doing what he's doing, Raymond's catching them in all the right spots and then they're doing the rest and it, it's working out. So it is a surprise. It, it feels like it shouldn't be a surprise, but it definitely is a surprise. 
The thing I'd add to it too is like, you know, there's certain things in his game he still needs to add in. I, I think, um, he, I think there, there is a lot of that lines kind of down low retrieval stuff that, that still has gone through Larkin and Bertuzzi and then more recently Nemesnikov that, you know, that's going to be an element of his game that he'll need to do too. But, you know, right now for good reason, like if you can have Larkin and Bert- or Bertuzzi go into the corner to get the puck, like they got a comparative advantage of doing that over a 19 year old right now in the NHL. But that is something I think you'll need to add. What's crazy to me is that like how complete defensively and and mature and smart he's been. Like he doesn't seem to make, I I don't think the, Prashant can tell me on this. I don't think the advanced numbers have actually loved that line's defensive impact. And I, I'm trying to figure out why, because all three seem to have really good positioning. I don't feel like they make a ton of errors or anything like that. Um, but it does seem that like in, in an expected goals against per 60 way, they, the, the numbers don't love them there, but I've actually thought, and Brad, you can weigh in here. I, I think Raymond and Larkin and Bertuzzi are all really good two-way players. I, I have a guess as to why the defensive metrics don't love them. And that's because they can't always be on the ice with Mohart Cider. So they have at least two <laughs> more black holes out there with them. No, I, you know, I think my theory that I have not spent enough time actually evaluating, and I will maybe do this now that you've asked the question, Max, is I think what happens is those guys get trapped at the end of their shift a lot. So they'll attack in the offensive zone and then they may relinquish possession. And then I think they get stuck defending at the end of a shift. Um, that's something that's caught my eye a lot where they'll maybe have 30, 35 seconds of ozone possession. You know, they, they, they turn the puck over and then all of a sudden it's a minute and 10 shift and they just had to spend 40 seconds, you know, defending in their zone and they're tired and then uh, the, the puck ends up in their net. So uh, I will actually look into the timing of shots by their shift length to see if that actually makes sense but that's my sort of hypothesis on those three but i completely agree with what you said max i I still think there are elements to his game that that have to be added and because i was the uh devil's advocate for more insider i will be devil's advocate for lucas raymond you know again a lot of similar teenage players that have come in max you and i have talked about clayton keller and he was a guy who came in 65 points in 82 games for arizona in 2017 2018 playing on a line with Derek Stepan and Max Stomi. And that's a really good line that has a lot of similar characteristics to Detroit's line and Derek Stepan being a Dylan Larkin and Max Stomi being a Tyler Bertuzzi. And, and, and so how do you avoid that regression that we've sort of seen from Clayton Keller, you know, since that 19 year old season, it is adding those defensive elements into his game, not becoming that Keller Galchenyuk type of player that really benefited from playing with two sound line mates. Uh, as a teenager. So that's the piece that needs to be rounded out. I will say the the upside for Raymond is he was a really good defensive player in the SHL, hell of a defensive player. So I think the qualities are there. Um, He just sort of needs to develop them at a faster pace. Yeah, he competes. He seems to to get into passing lanes. I I feel like I see multiple times him break up a neutral zone, you know, pass that that is an attempted kind of stretch pass to to start something the other way. And and he's in the way to break it up or he's lifting a stick or, you know, he does savvy things. And yeah, Ryan and I did that uh, article on him where, where we kind of watched every single one of his shifts and and uh i thanks again ryan i appreciate that and uh you know that, toward the end of that game he made a crucial game saving right this is this was the raymond one he made a crucial yeah, game saving yeah, yeah. defensive play at anaheim i mean yep. they lost the game but uh yeah. at the time it, 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 it preserved the regulation uh you know, sent it to overtime <laughs> and that's why trevor zegris is no i'm kidding um <laughs> Speaking of things that we did together, Max, uh, we had a great lunch in Mexican town once. No, we were just recently on the uh, <laughs> the hockey PDO cast with with Dmitry Filipovich, and we had a good discussion on Dylan Larkin, who, funny enough, isn't the biggest story of this season uh, for the Red Wings this year, which is incredible because of the bounce back season he's having. We've alluded to it with you know the, the elevated play, how much of that is due to Bertuzzi and Raymond, and vice versa. Um, but there's no discounting what he's done this year. He's, I'm pretty sure right now, yeah, he's at a point per game. Uh, he's on the second last year of his contract at $6.1 million per year. What has changed for Dylan Larkin to bounce back and have the kind of season that he's having? And, uh, you know, moving forward, there's a big question of what's his number going to look like for the Red Wings. That's the most interesting thing about it is I don't even know what's changed. Like, I, he still looks like Dylan Larkin to me. And, and I've, you know, that's why like last year when the numbers were not what they are right now, like right now we're talking about a guy who's on a point per game, 40 old pace. Um, 
like I, I don't I don't know why he wasn't last year. You know, you, you can it's easy enough to say shooting percentage, and right now he's shooting seventeen percent, which is above his career average. And you know, you can point to that and say, well, it was you know seventeen percent this year, and it was six point seven last year, and that's the only difference. It honestly could be that simple um, that, that the pucks are just finally going in, and he, and he's getting you know his uh, his change, so to speak, from what what he was owed last year. Um, but I, he just he looks dominant. He, he's still one of the fastest players in the NHL. He's still super competitive. Um, I don't know. Are you guys seeing anything majorly different? To me, he looks like Dylan Larkin and, and the puck is going in now. Um, I, I do think playing with Bertuzzi and Raymond helps. Like I think him and Bertuzzi have always complemented each other really well. And I think Raymond, to Prashanth's point that he's made, um, and I think made even before the season. So this is a hat tip to Prashant. Um, Raymond's playmaking is certainly something that I th- think could help explain why the pucks are going in now. Cause now Dylan Larkin has someone to get him the puck when he's in these dangerous areas. That's about, those are about the only things I could think of. A little bit of positive regression, having the right line mates, everything else. It looks like Dylan Larkin to me. And, and I mean that as a compliment. I've thought Dylan Larkin is number one center, um, pretty much straight through here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, Fascinating question. I mean, you're talking about a guy who's now all of a sudden on a 40 goal pace. I think the biggest thing that I've seen that's different, and, and Brad, I'll let you should comment on on this a little bit more. Number one, his shot actually looks better. I don't recall his shot looking as good as it's looked. Like, yeah, the puck's going a little bit more, but he's also ripping it, um, and he's picking his spots better. I think it's a lot. Um, a lot of improvement. I don't know if he specifically worked on that this off season, but it looks noticeably different to me. And then the second piece of it is I think space Um, in years past, a lot of teams could key in on Dylan Larkin because he was the driver of the line. He was the guy that flew into the zone. You know, you would have Manthan Bertuzzi uh, a little bit last year, but I think Raymond's patience with the puck and Tyler Bertuzzi's doggedness in retrieving the puck has created a little bit of more dead areas in the ice for Dylan Larkin to attack. I think where he's getting to shoot the puck from is also better spots than he was in years past, and he's doing it with less defense in his face. That's all theory. That None of that I've proved objectively, but that is what my eye sees, is that he's operating with more space, with a better shot, and lo and behold, he's able to make better plays, and I think a large part of that is the guys on the ice are, are guys that you have to focus on as a, as a defense. You cannot just key in on Dylan Larkin's speed. Um. Yeah, to follow up with the shot thing, I have noticed his shots better as well. Um, I could be seeing things just because I'm looking for things, but it does look like his weight transfer on his shot is a little more aggressive this year. Like he's almost taking that extra split second to load up on it, whereas in previous seasons he could have been rushing the shot a little bit, understanding that, hey, if I have that extra half a second, use that extra half a second rather than just, you know, getting the shot off from wherever as quick as he can. But I think the biggest thing for it this year is the quality of linemen he's playing with. And I'm not even going to say quality of linemen, quality of team around him, because Larkin is a guy who thrives off the rush. And it's been no secret for the last handful of years, the Detroit defenseman has had a real struggle getting the puck up to the forwards at all, let alone at the right time. So some positive regression from Heronic. Obviously, Cider coming in doing what he's doing. And it's one of the strengths of Nick Letty's game. That's a really stark difference this year versus what he had to work with last year in terms of the transition game. And then because he gets so far a near full season out of Bertuzzi, where, correct me if I'm wrong, Bertuzzi didn't even make it 25% of the season last year. No, nine, nine games, games last year. Nine games. So, yeah, he had... So Larkin spent a majority of the year without Bertuzzi and then Mantha got traded. So there was a stretch of games there. He was playing with neither of them. Um, now when he's got line mates where they can't hyper fixate on him, Raymond's a threat, Bertuzzi's a threat. So Larkin's getting a lot of, you know, to steal a football term, he's getting a lot of one-on-one situations. And with his skill and speed, he's going to win a lot of those and create space for himself. Um, so I think all those factors coming in is just the perfect storm of, quite honestly, what a proper top line should look like, how a proper hockey team should function. So when you have a player, the caliber of a Dylan Larkin, you can really expose the strengths and you don't have to worry about making up for X, Y, and Z elsewhere. Well, and I think all three of us at various times have said some variation of this, which is that like Dylan Larkin 
is has been a number one center, but it's been hard to judge in in the context the Red Wings have had, right? Like it's it's one thing to to look at what what they do and and the numbers and even the underlying numbers, um, and and say okay, this is where he stacks up in relation to these guys, but you can't account you can't properly fully account for kind of the context of of, of guys playing situation until you see a minute. Like we 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 couldn't have known. How different, you know, Dylan Larkin would have looked in the shoes of, say, Evgeny Kuznetsov for the last three, four years on a team that had, you know, two lines of, of offensive playmakers. And, um, you know, we still don't know that, that difference, I guess. But to me, he's looked like, you know, Prashant and I, I think at one point tried to, tried to literally slot him. Like, where in the NHL, yeah. where among the centers are we? I think we settled somewhere between 20 and 30. Yeah. Does that sound yeah, right? I think we were right around 20, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. And, and I think at this point, like, I would feel pretty comfortable saying Dylan Larkin's like that right, right there at that maybe even top 20 centers in the NHL. Um, and, and I think one of the big keys to unlocking it, and you guys make great points as to why, has been the, the growth of the Red Wings, whether that's in terms of the line mates or I love Brad's point about defense that, that will push the puck up ice because if, if you could get a defining trait onto what problems Dylan Larkin causes for a defense, a lot of it is, Oh God, here he comes. And, and, and you got to have someone to get the puck up to him to create that feeling, you know? I mean, I think there's one other thing. You, Max, you mentioned growth of the team. I'm going to mention growth of Dylan Larkin, his penalty rate. He's not taking penalties this year. You know, each of the last several years, if you look back in his career, he was basically averaging one penalty every three games that he was playing. You know, guy would end up sitting 40, 50, 60 penalty minutes. He's cut that in half this year. He is spending way less time in the penalty box, and I think that's also offering him more time with regular line, ma- line mates, less disruption of those uh, offensive lines. And I think it's all it's all really a maturation of his game, uh, to be quite honest. What do we make of the fact that he's playing a minute and a half less than he did last year and two and a half minutes less a night than he did two years ago? Do we think that has any role here? Somewhat to do with his neck, right? Like, at least to, to some degree. I was just thinking, like, does, does the fact that the Red Wings have don't have to rely oh. so much on one line? Is that, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that doesn't make sense, but that's that seems like a theory. There's two obvious reasons for it. The biggest one is Pew Suter. I wouldn't call him an above average or even an average NHL second line center, but he's a big upgrade from what they were printing out last year. So now Larkin doesn't have to take every key situation because Suter is capable of it. And um, the other one is uh, I. Could be wrong, but I saw his PK time was down. So if we want to, he's give, not uh, PKing at all. Yeah, right exactly. Right yeah, yeah. So that could be the reason itself, right there, is because you have Suter and Rasmussen who are capable penalty killers that can go out and do that, and they don't have to worry about Larkin taking one off the ankle three, four times a game. I saw uh, something on Twitter today. It was like Larkin out with upper body injury. And I was like, oh, God, what now? And it was like his back from carrying this team. And it was funny. Um, but it was would have been way more apt for previous years because I think the summary here is that the guy finally has some help. One thing that we talked about, Max, was um, there is probably – you can count on one hand guys in the league who are more competitive than Dylan Larkin at most. This is a guy who absolutely hates to lose. So, yeah, it's not like he ever – there was never the question of, you know, when we when the Red Wings had Anthony Mantha, this guy doesn't care or there's no drive. Like Dylan Larkin was giving it 110, 120 every shift. So it's nice to see him have the help and turn that around. Yeah, now, I think t- a lot of I, – I know I said Tyler Bertuzzi's maybe been their best player. That, that might be true, but I still think Dylan Larkin is in – is 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 in uh, a lot of ways kind of the heartbeat, the engine of, of the team. And, and I think, you know, this year's pretty good proof that, that he can – be that into the future and, and maybe becomes even more valuable as, as that, uh, as that process continues. Sorry to cut you off, Ryan. No, no. And it was, it's funny because you know, the Red Wings are very particular, obviously considering the history about picking their captains. So I think to some degree, it's a mix of they picked the consummate Red Wings captain. And I think uh, on the other, the flip side of it is he's grown into that role as well because he understands, I mean, having Henrik Zetterberg send you the C literally send you the C to your front doorstep is going to inspire something in you. Right. That doesn't, I don't know what will. It's funny because we talked about all these great players and and the Red Wings offensive rebound. And and now I'm going to bring the mood down a little bit. Um, The power play. We have seen both ends of the spectrum here. The start of the season, it was, you know, praise for Tangay. 
thank goodness they figured this thing out. There's some movement. There's some crossing passes. It's not just, you know, stale perimeter play. And especially of late, except for actually, you know, I think it was a couple of games ago where they potted too. Um, it's almost been the levels of the 2019 and 2020 season at times. What do we make of this power play and its seemingly boundless transition between among the best in the league and absolutely atrocious? I hate it. I hate it. I'm so <laughs> upset about it. Like this was the thing that I thought was going to improve. It looks so good in the preseason. Oh boy. I mean, they're right back to where they, they, they were for a majority of last year. I mean, if you look at, I mean, granted it was not hard to improve on last year. I think they were 11.4% on the power play last year or something absolutely absurd. One of the historically worst power plays of all time this year, they're still sub 15% when league average is close to 20%. I think over the last three years, there are two standard deviations below, you know, the league average, which is really, really bad. Bottom 5% is as is, is bad as you can be. And, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I think a lot of times we talk about people saying you need to have talented players to, to do it. But Buffalo has managed a, a really successful power play. Anaheim, yes, they have Zegris. And, and yes, they have Jamie Drysdale. But Detroit's got players like that, right? And Anaheim's got a top six power play in the NHL, and they're operating at like 26%, if I remember correctly. You know, so there there are teams that can do this. It is not entirely reliant on just elite talent. I mean, Anaheim had a power play that was like 10% two years ago, and now they're at 20-plus percent. You can turn this around, and it has to do with movement, handedness, and smart, quick decision-making. We've seen flashes of it, but we just haven't seen it sustain long enough to really make an impact. So there's a couple approaches I could take here because there's a lot wrong with this power play. So I'll, I'll give the easy cop-out answer first that I don't think is fully true, but can at least be used as a reason lately. They look scared to make mistakes, which means they don't push seams. They don't push through the middle. They don't try to do anything outside of the system. That's been a more recent problem because obviously they've been on a skid, so it makes sense. Confidence has been down. Early in the season, even in October, when the power play looked good, it was because the puck movement was a lot quicker. They were passing, making passes just for the sake of making a pass. And it doesn't look like much when a team does that. But every time that puck moves from point A to B, it makes someone on the defense move. And if you move the puck enough, someone's going to screw up. Sometimes it'll be your team. Sometimes it'll be their team. But when you're on the power play, if it's your team, it just ends up in your zone. When it's their team, it ends up in their net. So... That's why the Red Wings, in my opinion, were having success because they weren't afraid to move the puck. They were tossing it around. It was just bang, bang, bang. The downside was they were still running the same shitty umbrella they've always done. They were just doing it more effectively than they used to. The Red Wings, like three times this year, have tried the play where the puck goes from the half wall below the goal line into the slot. The Braden Point special in Tampa Bay. All three times they've tried it, it resulted in a scoring chance. And they don't can do it again for five games after they do it. Their good offenses work low to high these days. And I think Prashant, you're actually one of the guys who bangs the drum for this. The Red Wings almost never attempt it. To this day, it haunts me. Opening night a couple of years ago against Dallas, where the Red Wings had a power play and they ran the puck around the perimeter from point to point to below the goal line to below the goal line as Anthony Mantha was wheeling around. And as soon as that puck went behind the net, he was right in the slot and cranked the one-timer and Kudobin made a ridiculous glove save, but it was the greatest play I've ever seen them run on the power play. Not once since that moment have they tried that again. Not once. So... They they have these flashes of success success running at low to high, and then they never do it again. So at the beginning of the season, they were running a bad system, but they were moving the puck so quickly, it did create mistakes. But I think both those things, the speed disappearing and the fact that they're not even changing the system and running the same shitty umbrella for four years straight, and we get the the result we expect. Well, to quote a wise man, what else is there to say? Um, but uh, no, I, I think you guys hit on a lot of the importance. I think the quick passing ultimately is probably the key. I, I agree with Brad. Like you score on a power play when you create chaos and the best way to create chaos is to get guys to do anything other than 
stand where they're standing because they're in good yep. spots. That's why the structure is what it is. It, it, it Even with like we talked about the seam passes, I think one reason they haven't made as many seam passes is because guys are in the lane. Like that, if the seam pass isn't there, that pass gets broken up. And if you don't get guys moving, that pass is not going to be there. I watched Adam Fox do something in a game. Um, it was a replay on NHL Network. So I don't know when it aired, but I, I'm guessing last night just based on – why else would they re-air it? Um, but he skated the puck. So he, he was at the top. That's where the defenseman stands. This might have even been like a four on three, but I, I think it wasn't. And he, he took it wide and he, he took it, you know, drew a defender out with him. And then it was just a little pass across, right across the crease to Chris Kreider for what looked like the easiest goal on earth, right? Like, and you see it happen and it's like, okay, we'll just do that. You know, run the play where the defenseman skates it wide and does that. And that's not what I'm saying, but I do often wonder when I watch a power play, they look so choreographed and I know they're not like they're, they're making decisions um, based on what they see, based on, you know, where the space is, whatever. But I, I often wonder like what would happen if you just didn't tell any of the guys on the ice, Hey, you're on the power play. Like if, if you watch the Red Wings play ozone and you know, I do, and I know you all do, <laughs> I'm not saying it's perfect, but sometimes you, you really think, and obviously the numbers say that, that the Red Wings power play numbers are still better than the Red Wings uh, expected goals four per 60 at, uh, at at even strength. But I, I just wonder, if at, at, at five on four, guys just played like they would normally play offense, would you be any worse off or would you even potentially be better off? Because you're doing things like skating with the puck. You're not w- worried about, okay, now I go back to the point. Now I go to the flank. Now I go to the bumper. Now I go to the flank. Now I go down low. Now I go to the bumper. Like, you know, not to say that there's an order that they want these guys doing it in because it, it's all reads. And you're reacting, but I do think you get so familiar with what are the, what are my three options that are just in terms of passing. And, and I do believe the quick passing matters, but I think sometimes it's easy to forget that you can just do what Adam Fox did and just take off and see what happens, see who you draw out of position and see what you can do. And I think they have smart enough players to do that. Now, what does that mean? I have no clue. I am not going to pretend like I know what you want a power play. I do not, but these are just some of the thoughts that I have sometimes when you watch. I mean, just Max, tell them it's you want a delayed the penalty. Yeah, I mean, do you want the twenty thousand version, like word version, or do you want like the two hundred word version? Because I have both of those always ready to fire. Like, hey, it's not my that's podcast. The one in- <laughs> Go as long as you want, baby. <laughs> that's the one in the chamber. I mean, like Brad, Brad hit the nail on the head. If you think about the way the modern penalty kill is designed, it's designed as a check press or a wedge plus one, however you want to call it. It's essentially a diamond in the slot. The objective of it: take away the most dangerous area of the ice, which is the slot, and every effort on the power play should be destabilizing that diamond, which is moving the guys around, getting them to change their sight angles, getting them to change their stick angles. You can do that with short passes that are high percentage. You can do that by skating around like Adam Fox and Kale McCarr do, by changing passing lanes. The 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 reason that why that, that half forward to goal line to slot pass is so effective is that each of the defenders has to snap their head around 90 degrees on each pass. They have to turn and they cannot defend who they can't see, which is stuff behind them. And so that's that's what is so good about that play. But you have to have the right handedness. You know, you have to have to go left, right, left. You have to go right, left, right. You have to have the ability to make those quick passes. And and those are just the simple details that that I feel like are really easy to fix. And if you just explain and enable the players by just putting them in position to succeed by giving the right handedness out there by by sort of letting them know. Hey, these are the looks I want you to have. And don't overcoach it. Don't sit there on the half boards and try and force the pass all the way across. Move. Move the puck. Move yourself. But whatever you do, it has to be destabilizing that diamond. Otherwise, you're going to throw the puck in there. And this isn't even talking about the zone entries, which have been abysmal as well. But I I don't have enough time on this podcast to, to, to do that. Well, I think we could do the power play for probably an hour and a half, but we do have to wrap at some point. So I want to touch on a couple other things here. Uh, let's bring it back to the positivity with the promise that I we're going to get negative again in a second. Um, there's obviously the big five-ish players that the Red Wings are being carried by all year. But I think there are some stories here for guys who are performing well, who aren't necessarily you know, Cider, Raymond, Bertuzzi, Larkin, etc., uh, forward or defense, who do you think deserves a little bit more attention and some more eyes on what they've been doing this season? P.U. Suter. I, I think, you know, not only has he been, like Brad said, the best second line center Detroit's had, um, at least in my time on the beat, 
the guy's 25. Like he, he could stick around and, and be a legit. I don't know if he's necessarily legit too, but I think he could be a above average third line center. And, and you don't look at his build and, and say that, but you look at everything else in his profile and do the guy's smart. The guy can make plays. The guy gets to the net. The guy kills penalties. Um, I, I don't know. Like, if, is it like a John Gabriel Pajot situation where you, where you get one of these guys who's just like a really natural, really good third line center that you put the right pieces around him and all of a sudden that, That'll play. Like, I think P.U. Suter has been a revelation for them. Um, I don't know if I get a, a plus one there, but I'd add, I think Gustav Lindstrom's been better than, um, I would have seen coming too. And, and those are two guys who you look at them and you go, okay, those are two more pieces the Red Wings had that I didn't know they had six months ago. And, and that's one of my big takeaways from the first half. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's, it's Vladislav Nemesnikov. Like, he was a guy that a lot of people were, um, you know, when the expansion draft discussion was happening, they were like, oh, no one should protect him. Red Wings ultimately don't protect him. And then he sticks around. He had a sort of down year for him last year. And I think people were expecting him to do a lot more. And part of that was the Red Wings were asking probably more than what he could contribute. We, hey, you need to play 2C behind Dylan Larkin. You need to do all these other things. I think that was probably just a little too much. This year, his game seems a lot more focused, dialed in. He's been incredible. In fact, he's allowed them to break up that top line and now roll two effective lines by letting them move Tyler Bertuzzi down to play with Suter and Fabry and then him being able to sort of pick up Bertuzzi's role on the top line and still keep that Larkin, Raymond, Nemesnikov line very, very dangerous. So I think he's a guy that definitely deserves a huge shout out for the way he's rebounded uh, from his down year last year. Well, since both you guys took uh, the two answers I had, <laughs> um, I won't waste time by trying to make one up. So I'll just say I liked Mitchell Stevens before he got hurt. <laughs> hey, Brad, none of us have talked about Nadelkovic at all. You could have just slid that in there and right. taken that. We Ryan said the big five. Nadelkovic is in the big five. But we didn't actually talk about it. <laughs> That's right. I did, I did accidentally force us to skip past net. And I am going to hop on this and say, wow, have the Red Wings completely done everything we hoped they could when Eisman made that trade, I understand somewhat what the reasoning was as to Carolina's moving Alex Ndelkovic. Disagreeing with that is a whole other conversation and not necessarily worth airtime because he's playing for the Red Wings now. But he, aside from, I would say, a five-game adjustment period to playing behind this Red Wings defense has been absolutely outstanding. He's not immune to bad games. No Red Wings goaltender behind this team ever will be. But there are so many games where he's just outright won them or has kept them within one or two or three goals when they have been by far the worst team. And that is a massive, massive relief for Detroit. Jonathan Bernier gave them that kind of goaltending a lot over the past couple of years. Uh, Grice, I would say towards the latter third of last year, did gave him a lot of good goaltending. But for Detroit to be able to have that with consistency and with youth, you know, there's no real question about Alex Ndelkovic besides what his next contract is. He's 26 years old right now, making $3 million for the rest of this year and next. Uh, that opens up a world of options for them, and that opens them – that opens them up to be very, very patient with Sebastian Kosa as well, who they spent uh, to Prashant's, um, uh, Prashant's ire, if you will. I'm so sorry. I'm sure you've heard that joke a million <laughs> times. A lot of draft capital on. Um, and, and that's important. You know, the rebuild isn't just Simon Edvinson or whatever winger or center which they eventually have to draft. Uh, it's goaltending as well. So a move that – happened out of nowhere, didn't cost Steve Eisenman almost nothing in terms of capital and has made a massive, massive impact for the Red Wings. So when do we start the trade COSA discussion? Uh, well, we have to get past the next discussion, which I was going to call this segment, which player is underperforming or better named? Uh, are we going to try to think of a player not named Philip Zadina for this, for this portion? Because this has been a pretty significant year for all the worst reasons for, for Philip Zadina. Why don't we dive into that and talk about what's happened with him to date? I don't really, there's no byline for this. Just what's going on with Philip Zadina. I'd rather not. All right. And that's this segment. <laughs> I mean, the simple answer for me that probably and not a lot of people are going to be happy with is I really do think a lot of it is just bad luck on ice. Like, you sort of look at the underlying metrics. He's one of the top five forwards for them in terms of expected goals for percentage. Things happen. 
in the offensive zone when he's there, the puck is just not going in the net. Um, and it's not going in off of his stick and it's not, uh, you know, going in at five on five. I don't know if that has anything to do with the line mates that he's playing with, not being able to finish and him in, in particular, not being able to finish recently. I think also not having the power play clicking with good puck movement is, is another reason why you're not seeing the goal totals there. But I mean, at the end of the day, he's got a better five on five expected goals for percenters than Dylan Larkin. Now I'm not saying he's been better than Dylan Larkin, but Things are still happening when he's on the ice. It's just the puck's not ending up in the back of the net. It's it's so complicated. And it's so like it, it, you're right. It feels like you're just beating the same horse, and it, it, I don't think everything can be just luck. Right. And, and I think there are demonstrated things, but it feels like the the number of things that he needs to do differently is smaller than the when you look at 17 games without a goal, when you look at the amount of frustration that there seems to be around his play, like the number of things I think he needs to do differently are much smaller than that. Like proportionally, like I, Jeff Blasio pointed this out and I had noticed this in, in a couple of recent games. There are plays where Zadina has the puck. He's in the slot. He looks like he's about to get a really prime um, chance off in the slot and a guy pokes it off his stick or, or, you know, he just runs out of room or something like that. And, and those are things that he needs to do different, right? He needs to get that release off quicker. He needs to at least know where that pressure is coming from um, and get, get the puck on net and then go look for a rebound if you want to. Like, that's something that he can do better. I think he can get stronger and that'll put him in a better position to, to be in the areas of the ice where you have to be to score. But like, other than that, I just don't think, I, I think he, he can even maybe work on a shot a little bit in a way that like, you know, I think he gets it on net. And I, I just think when I saw him in that very first development camp after the draft, I thought this was like a sniper of a goal scorer and that hasn't been the reality. I don't know why, um, but but a shot is one of the things that you can just fire, you know, up umpteenth or you know however many untold amounts of of pucks, um, and I, that may be oversimplifying it, but it's just one of the things that you can just keep doing, and it's not kind of quite as dependent on you know like like speed, I guess, would be on kind of physical uh, you know technique or whatever. You just keep getting at it, and it. it I don't know what there's not, I don't know if there is even a, a silver bullet answer here for him, but it just feels like if he can do those things, if he work on the shot a little bit more, get it a little more precise, get it off a little bit quicker and, and put on a little bit of weight, like everything else that you see from him, just, it seems like that should be enough. And yet when you look at 17 games without a goal, I, I, I definitely hear how kind of maybe ridiculous it sounds to say that that's all it's going to take. Like it's, it's, there's a weird disconnect there and, that's why I guess I call it complicated because I, I'm, I'm not saying it's been all luck, but I also, I can't, when I watch his game, I can't think of things beyond that that are lacking in, in, in his game relative to, you know, other good players, other players who are, are good middle six and maybe even top six players. Like those are the only things that stand out to me. So I saw someone mention it on Twitter. I want to say it was Jack Hahn, but I, I might have it wrong. Because obviously Zadina's shot seems to be the problem because, as you both mentioned, he's getting chances. They're not going in. And with how much it's not going in, you can't attribute it to solely luck. We've seen him be the sniper in juniors. We know he has the shot. And ever since it was pointed out to me uh, a few weeks ago, I've been paying attention to it. And I have noticed he actually does have one weakness in his shot. Deception. He has no deception on his shot. It is a straightforward shot, which when he gets all the time and space in the world, him and the goalie, he will win that battle more often than not. Um, and he's shown that in the past. That that's the case, especially in junior. He could overpower every goalie in that league with his shot. No problem. In the NHL, he loses that time and space. He doesn't have that curl and drag that Matthew ha Matthews has and other players have to dig it around the defenseman. He doesn't shoot it off his off foot if that's his only option. He doesn't really take a, a lot of great shots off the rush if he's got a defender on him. So the shooting talent is there. He just needs to be able to mix it up and, and work on those off balance shots and how to get that shot around a defender when he's only got a half a second. So I'm in the same boat as you guys. I have zero complaint, not zero, but I have almost no complaints about his overall game, but the puck has to start going in the net. And to me, that's the only thing that I, I can really visually see and go, yeah, that would help. The only thing I, I kind of want to add to all this is that 
and I don't know if this is something people say or not, but just a little bit of perspective from, from getting to, you know, talk with Philip a few times over the last few years. And obviously it, it less often in the last couple because of, um, COVID, but even still then, like we've gotten to sit a couple of times and, and talk and, and obviously deal with him in press conferences. Like this is not a guy who does not care. Like this is a guy who's, if anything, too hard on himself. And that's something that I think, um, shouldn't get lost in all this. That's a, that's a, um, mental factor that is impossible to quantify, but, um, I, I, have never once questioned like whether Philip Zadina is, is driven to become the kind of player that, um, we, we all on, on draft day kind of thought, okay, he can be. And I, I still think that he has the drive and, and, and the want to do that. And so that part is no question for me. And that's why I'm inclined to be pretty patient, even, you know, relative to, to, uh, what we've, what we've talked about today. Like I'm, I'm, pretty inclined to say, well, just keep giving it time because like we said, there's not that many holes in the game. It, it's just, you know, why aren't they going in? And, you know, I do think he's going to keep putting the work in for it. All right. Well, uh, we didn't tackle every topic I had on the list for us today, which just means we have to do this again. Of course, um, Brad does have to run off to watch, I think, an episode of The Bachelorette uh, with all of his friends. So you mean uh, you're not? No, I have to drive there as fast as I can, and it's snowing too. So, uh, Max uh, Boltman of the Athletic Detroit, like I always say, and I'll continue to say until it stops being true, worth the price of admission on his own. So, if you're not subscribed to the Athletic De- Detroit to read what Max is writing, uh, you're doing something wrong. Uh, M underscore Boltman on Twitter and Prashanth Iyer uh, at Iyer underscore Prashanth. Uh, give him a follow if you're not not already one of the best and most knowledgeable follows you can have. So, guys, thank you so so much. Uh, and can't wait to do this again soon. We got it. Our pleasure, man. Thanks for having us. Always. It's great to see you guys. And that was our roundtable with Max Boltman and Prashanth Iyer. Uh, appreciate them coming on the show again. Um, it was it's funny because that's one of the longest conversations we've had with them. And an hour still wasn't enough to recap. And that was just mid-season. I texted after and I said, you guys are fortunate. You just narrowly escaped what's your hot take for the trade deadline question. So we'll have to double back for that one. You're welcome, everybody. Yeah. Uh, and as we were taking our break to splice in the interview, <laughs> Evan was telling us about how his home theater has <laughs> Dolby <laughs> Atmos surround sound. And Brad goes, I have three scratches on my TV screen, which make it distracting to watch hockey. And they look suspiciously like the t- the blade of uh, Hank's hockey stick. So <laughs> <laughs> that is not a hockey play. No, the duality of winged wheel podcasters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Crystal and I like. I was I forget where I was, but I was just I think it was at like Walmart or something picking some up. I'm like, ah, I might as well go see what like whatever TVs are going for these days. And I went and walked around. I'm like, I can live with the scratches. <laughs> Yeah, really nice ones. Like there aren't any budget options for the truly, truly nice ones. No, it's either zero or all. Yeah, yeah. You can get like um, a fifty-five inch, like off-brand, which is what's in this room with us. 50- you go to Zares, a grocery store, and get a fifty-five inch TV these days. Yeah, it's off-brand. It'll run you like four or five hundred bucks. Not nothing, but it's not two, three grand. But if you want, it's like, going. Yeah. If you want like <laughs> the real stuff, like the blackest blacks, the like the most vibrant colors. Holy f- is it worth it? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> when Evan is eventually found dead on the side of the road, our first suspect will be Brad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely will be. It'll uh, probably happen after a Bills game. Yeah, the way things are going. Yeah. Okay. Um, a few things that have happened. Aaron Dell. Crushed Drake Batherson, who's skating behind the net. Batherson, was it fractured his ankle? High ankle sprain out two months. Yeah. Aaron Dell got suspended three games for that. Yeah. I fully agree with it. If you can't crush a goalie behind the net, they should not be allowed to touch you. This is why they should get rid of the goaltender interference rule, <laughs> like I've suggested before. Everybody's fair game. Um, Evander Kane has verbally agreed, but not actually technically signed with Edmonton yet. It's all but done. And apparently he's not being disciplined for whatever the alleged COVID breach was. We need more information on that before chatting about it more. So maybe we'll save that for next episode. All I'll say is it's good to see Ken Holling, Holland upholding his principles of it's all about culture and whatnot in the room. Really, really happy he's keeping yeah, to that theme. Taking a massive risk. Someone say he's rolling the dice. <laughs> 
And Arizona is in talks to play the next three to four years, reportedly, um, in a 5,000-seat arena. What are- no, 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 no. It's not a 5,000-seat arena. It's a university arena that university students use. That holds 5,000 people. Where they don't get scheduling priority. Mm. They will be a tenant in the arena. They, sorry, we can't fit you in. There's men's D-League intramural hockey at this time. <laughs> Again, I'll repeat. What are we even doing here? I'm what sure. owner wants to Subsidize leverage that. and subsidize this shit show? What Imagine, if- what if Winnipeg had to play in a 5,000 person state arena. Do you think Gary Bettman would have kept them there? They're Absolutely they're small. not. There's is 15,000, but their fans also pay really premium prices for those tickets. I, something tells me that even though the Coyotes are going to be playing in front of 5,000 fans and, you know, memes aside, they, they do average more than 5,000 fans a game. So they probably will sell out. They're probably not going to be at Winnipeg Jets prices. No, absolutely not. So I wonder how the other, 31 NHL owners feel about this because that is, you know, let's f- remember revenue sharing is a thing. Jeremy Jacobs, like the think of those big name owners, like the absolutely colossal giant owners who pinch pennies and have been the problem in every lockout, whatever it might be. How are they going to allow this? They aren't. What's the other option though? Move them. Yes. Yes. Do you think I don't know? It's it's I we I went on my like thirty minute rant yeah, about yeah. how everything nothing of what they're doing makes any damned sense, and this doesn't help. You're gonna play in a five thousand seat arena for three to four more years to build a brand new state of the art arena that you're gonna half fill for the next ten so years. Five thousand people can go watch you. <laughs> like, and you know what would be the worst. Is if let's say they do this because it's within the realm of possibility. And hey, by the time we actually give this full conversation next episode, Friedman said it's basically a done deal. Did he actually? Yes. They're going to have a night where they don't sell out. <laughs> yes. And think about that. Honestly, just release the tickets to students for 20 bucks and let them just go buck wild. Yeah. Make, make Coyotes games the greatest atmosphere in the NHL just so you can have some redeeming quality in this because. Again, even if they were in a temporary 20,000-seat arena, it's still a terrible idea because this is a franchise that has been failing for 25 years consistently. And you're going to go dump, what, $500 million, even $100 million into a brand new arena just to half-fill that and have the same damn problems you've had for the last 25 years? Everything about this is pure lunacy. I don't believe anything is a done deal with Arizona. No. The story no, changes every can't. six hours. Yeah. You can't. I've never I've never once on this podcast taken a piece of news and said, I don't trust that this isn't going to change. Let's kick it to the next episode. But that's actually what I want to do. All right. That's a joke. Well, uh, between now and next episode, what we want you to do is brainstorm places where Arizona could possibly move. The moon. Mm. Too I close. Might be, yeah, it might be cheaper, actually, than... And building the new arena. Uh, well, I hear Buffalo's needed a hockey team for a while. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to jump into overtime on this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast. Um, to all of our patrons, we thank you for supporting the show, um, allowing us to do basically run this and constantly be on our bullshit. So we appreciate you. And uh, patrons are likely, this is not scientific fact, but I just feel like they are likely to live on average five years longer. They're a couple inches taller, and they have a better facial structure. So uh, patreon.com slash podcast if you want to support the show. And r- allegedly, no scientific guarantee have those benefits. All right. Let's take a few uh, questions here. Lower Spirits says, at this time, I don't believe anyone should give up on Zadina. Troy Terry had some lackluster point seasons as well. The seasons he split between the Gulls and the Ducks, and look at the breakout season he's having. I have faith Zadina's touch will spark at some point. I'd rather have it be for the Wings than giving up and having it happen for someone else. I could have sworn. Wasn't Troy Terry on waivers at one point? No. No? No. There's no way he would have cleared. And I mean, you know, Zadina's had his chance. How do you not score with elite playmaker Michael Rasmussen at center? Well, when he's scoring all the goals, it's very difficult to find the, the time to do it yourself. 
that leads me to a question from new patron Puck Norris. Uh, Mr. Norris, thank you so much for your support. We really appreciate you joining the Dub Dub Club. It says, first time patron, excited to be part of the Dub Dub Club with the lack of production and being on a line with Rasmussen and Ernie. Do you think having Zadina on the third line is hurting his game? Would you guys switch him with Vlad on the first line? It would give Zadina a shot to play with more skillful players and possibly boost his confidence and get over his yips. And maybe having Vlad on the third line might create more of a spark. So there's two ways to answer this, uh, and I'll try and be as fair. Vlad has definitely earned that spot on the top line this year more than Zadina has. So if we're going off merit right now, Vlad should be there. The counter argument. Vlad's a UFA at the end of this year and much older, and uh, there's probably a lot of sense to get Zadina up there to spark his confidence. And I think the way Vlad plays does complement the third line better, and the way Zadina plays does complement Larkin and Raymond better. So I definitely see the argument either way, but yeah, I want to see it for at least a couple games just if he goes up there for one period scores a goal and then you fire him back to the third line it's worth it <laughs> yeah i blashell had a, a a point i can't remember who he was talking to where he said um yeah i understand that notion but at some point you have to prioritize the success of the team over like individual players and you know what he's not wrong for saying that i think enough games have been out of reach this year where there's been opportunity um, or even on a tough back-to-back, or hey, you know, the next time you play in Canada, whatever it might be, I think it wouldn't hurt to do it. And for the people who are extremely angry at any kind of apologism for Zadina, I'm not going to change your mind, and that's fine. Um, and this isn't to say he's deserving necessarily, because I do genuinely believe Zadina's poor performance goes beyond just luck. There's certain mechanics to his game, which Brad, you've pointed out in the past, genuinely need to change, but. There is a mental aspect to it, and I just want to see what he does with the opportunity. We've done it for Rasmussen, and he Rasmussen's had points this year where he's been fine, and Rasmussen's had point this points this year where he's been atrocious, right? Like he's been all over that spectrum. So I don't know. It's we're only halfway through. I'm sure Zadina will get a chance at some point, but uh, what's our next question here? Um, Evans pickle loaded cheeseburger says. Ugh. If you could pick one, what would it be? Osgood in the Hall of Fame or 91 in the rafters? Oh, 91 in the rafters for sure. I would say 91 in the rafters just because there's a lot of other guys, Red Wings, who I want in the Hall of Fame before. Ozzy, and that's not Ozzy slander. If he makes it in, I'm thrilled, but I'm Hank, Pav, et cetera, et cetera. Where are you at? Uh, Fedorov as well. Uh, okay. Cody Stark says, who's your favorite UFA goalie next year that you'd be fine with backing up Ned? I myself wish the wings would snag a veteran from Europe or something. I dislike using the old washed up goalie market market for backups. I have not even looked at who the UFA goalies are, so I do not have an opinion right now. Mark Andre Fleury would not play backup in Detroit. Nope. Not really interested in Miko Koskinen. Ah, yeah, maybe, maybe if he wants to come for cheap, but I don't think he will. It was last season or season before he put up a nine nineteen, and he's probably younger than most of these guys on the list. And again, I do not like Miko Koskinen as a starter. Backup, I could see. Darcy Kemper will go for too much money. Yep. Uh, Corpusalo eh. probably going to get too much. Georgiev will also get too much in yeah. Martin Jones if they want to get – hey, a couple of the Red Wings' terrible starts to games recently. And, like, actually, I want to say this. I have gone out of my way to be extremely – I don't want to say defensive of Blasio because I, I still am pretty critical at times. But to make sure that we're not bla- bashing Blasio over the head for things that aren't his fault, the Red Wings' extremely poor starts to games, that's on coaching. I'm sorry, that's on coaching. You cannot come out of the gate like that. They need to figure out a way to light a fire under those guys' ass. The hell does this have to do with UFA goalies? No, it doesn't. I just, <laughs> I don't know why I started thinking about Blashill halfway through this. Nothing to do with UFA goalies. Well, no, you can't. I was bring, very confused. You, <laughs> I was wondering where you were going. <laughs> you can't bring up Blashill. You get yelled up at ha- by half the fa- fan no, no. base either way. <laughs> and that, I actually should have said it earlier because I, I said, um, you know, we've done a lot of conversation about the Red Wings are tired and I've pushed that or like, you know, it's we're all tired. Yeah. Get over it. <laughs> There's not been a lot of practice and that's something I've pushed forward, but 
they had days off and they've had time to practice, Blashill needed to like Blashill and Tanga and, and Huda and all of them needed to have lit a fire under those guys' asses. They can't come out and play like that. Um, yeah, there's uh, I'm not too picky for the backup. I'm really not. <laughs> oh no. Connor Duke says, who ends the season with more goals? Giovanni sitting at two or Letty sitting at one currently? I'll take the hot take here for a different reason. I think Nick Letty probably buries a few for his new team. That was going to be mine. <laughs> Actually? Yeah. Oh, you're both very clever. <clears throat> uh, do, 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 do. Jonathan Melwish says, will you be watching Winter Olympics uh, for sports apart from hockey? And do you have a favorite? No, not really. Um, and if it was like prime time, I'd probably tune into most of the snowboarding events. That's probably it. Jeremy Dahl, this one's funny, says, Okay, gentlemen, I know this ask will be quite a bit for all of you, but it would mean a lot to me. Could you each say something nice about each other? Don't cheap out and each just pick one. I don't want you to avoid Brad. Yes, even you, Brad. Say something nice about each of the other two co-hosts. Say something nice about yourself as well as if you, if you can. I just want not even a question. You're just making that up. No. <laughs> Yeah, it's here. It's from Schmein Schmanna. <laughs> Not Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> also, I miss your dogs, Brad. Uh, Brad has an encyclopedic knowledge of hockey. You took mine. And Wow, I have a lot of great personality traits. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Evan is easily the funniest person in the room. He just chooses when to let it out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now do me. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there there it, is. it is. Clip it. There I told it you is. Clip it. <laughs> <laughs> um ryan you put in exponentially more work into the podcast than both brad and i combined and it's very much not said enough but it's thank you oh, and gosh. i appreciate it i had the same answer so i'll actually add to it while we're at it and he doesn't complain about it to us when he has every right to are you or mel <laughs> <laughs> that's because mel hears it i feel like i'm way too whiny so um you're whining about a lot of other things, and we notice, but that one you're good for. Okay, thank you for actually bringing that down. I don't take compliments well. <laughs> I was going to throw up in a second. Have you gone? Yeah, I just did yours. I haven't done Evans. Um, Evans, in a very high-stress world where most people suck, Evan is very easygoing, and I really appreciate that about him. This dude lets everything bounce off him, Yeah, and he's like, oh, well, time to go snowboarding. Yep, time to go to the golf course. Yeah, and yeah. If you suck. need, if you just need like ten minutes of chill in your life, like Evans, your guy, he is easily. Yeah, I actually, when we were uh, setting up for the event, I was like wound to the moon. You both saw me. I just wanted. I just looked at Evan when I needed to chill. He was the guy was just vibing. <laughs> yeah, he, he's just there, like admiring like the architecture or something. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have time uh, for one more comment here. I'm just trying to find... Actually, that, that setup was like the absolute microcosm of the whole work thing in this podcast. Evan and I started helping with what we could and what we knew what to do. And then as we're kind of getting down to it, and there's still a few more things to be done, Ryan's doing it. And um, Evan and I are on the other side of the garden teaching Mike how to play hockey <laughs> in the shooting thing they had set up. <laughs> I remember at one point thinking, why am I irritated right now? And I'm like, I'm a super like a, a noise person when there's noise I don't want. Uh, like it drives yeah, me nuts. That was definitely not a quiet event. And that was a glass room with like the, the sticks on the, uh, <laughs> the plexi. I was like, why am I pissed off right now? Oh, the whack, 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 <laughs> shoot. And then I was like, I can't be pissed about that. Okay, last comment here uh, is from your friendly neighborhood. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I might, I may be off, but does anyone else feel that Bert should definitely stay on the wings? To me, he sh he seems like a Brad Marchand type. Became elite later in his career. Gets greasy goals. Can set you up. Play physical. I can really envision Bert contributing to a cup contending wings team at age thirty two to thirty four. Hot take, I'm easy. I'm okay with Steve giving him 7 million times 6 years to keep him if that's what it takes. It's just so hard to find players like him. As someone who has brought up the question, I feel like I owe it to the conversation to say this is a very fair comment. It is extremely fair because Bert and Max said it in the roundtable. What else does Bert have to prove? Right? Like the, the things contributing to him potentially being dealt are concerns about long term with his back, which you mentioned. 
and the contract situation. There's obviously the additional extracurriculars about, you know, whether or not he can ever play in Canada. And we don't know if he'll ever change his mind or Canada will ever change their minds. We're not going to make predictions on that because we don't know. But that aside, there's still some risk factors. Yeah, my, my thoughts on what to do with Bertuzzi at this point almost have nothing to do with him as a player. Yeah. Like, that's the sad reality of it. We, we know who he is as a player and who he is as a player is very, very valuable. But if you can't sign him, then it doesn't matter. If we, if the Red Wings could sign Burt to seven by six right now, I would do that. I would sprint to the contract to do that. Would you not? Seven years holding? So seven million times six years. Oh. He's 26 right now, I believe. Yeah, it's probably in the neighborhood. Is he going to want more? Probably. He's producing like he should get more. He'll be 27 at, by the end of the year. He, he turns 27 in about a month. Yeah, I'd, I'd be comfortable signing him to a pretty decent cap until he's about 32, 33. Again, back issues. Is, again, the back issues are one of the problems with it being a clear-cut answer. But who he is as a player probably ages better than most just because he doesn't rely on speed and stuff that generally tend to deteriorate first. He's not the fastest guy in the world, so... No, his skating is arguably below league average, and he's still a crazy effective player, so... I love every picture of Burt, where if it's not the missing tooth, it's also a black eye. <laughs> like a cut on his forehead. He's like... Someone drew a hockey player, and that's what Burt is. Anyways, it, you you all should know that when we talk about Bertuzzi, we also know, like, it doesn't have to guaranteed be a trade. Tyler Bertuzzi, if you had to think of one player on the Red Wings who would be a... a playoff dynamo he's your guy you're not wrong there's just a lot of other questions about it which is why it's worth the discussion okay we've run long this episode we want to thank all of our listeners um our name level sponsors uh, on patreon arjun shanker Eves bartels on behalf of the sarah Garan foundation kyle Karagitz, nick perks brett bailey uh terry driver of the number 69 crying ryan Hen has banana slam and jamathong taylor tagel matthew m rice b diz carl brutana nanaluski Chimmy, Citizen High Five, CJ Sully, Craig Kibble, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, Greech, Hana Lee, Hassam Al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Justin and the Angry Mob, Kaylin Wood, King Tone, Kyle Hashman, Licking Windows for Fun, <laughs> Matt McKay, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, Your Friendly Neighborhood Window Peeper, Zach Spring, Alex Blackmore, Andrew Bohan, um, Alex Blackmore, I believe a new name level sponsor. Welcome. Sam Bankson, Adam, I wish I could finish like Ernie, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landiscog, Ben Barron, Brad's dad, Brad's dad moan, Chub Nub, Connor Leighton, Dave W., Eric Sinkowski, Evan Spicy Rum Chata Booth, Evan's Bingo Card, James Laporte, Jeremy Brocker, John Evans, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Logan Stahl, Matt Keeler, Matt S, Max $1 million, Revy DeLuca, Terry Actual, Trevor Pevivar, Zach Handyside, and Zach McCann, a driving range superstar. Thank you all so much. Stay tuned for the Patreon exclusive overtime, and we'll talk to you on Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.